Story 1. Our first story is set on the Norwegian island of Svalbard also known as Spitsbergen, and concerns the tragic demise of Jana Kutya, a Ukrainian geologist working with a team of researchers on the island in 1978. Jana was supposed to only be on the island for two weeks, but due to complications with transport and financing, she and her team had to remain on the island for an entire month. Their food consisted of cans of frozen gruel and the occasional treat of sweets. They sometimes visited nearby towns for food and supplies, but that was once in a blue moon. Due to the isolation and the cold, tensions were rising within the group, and they were itching to go home. One particularly harsh argument fragmented them. In what was supposed to be a five-man trip to examine sediment on the southern coast of the upper archipelago of the island turned into a two-person trip consisting of Jana and her colleague Franz. The two were friends from college, and they often conducted research together to further their knowledge of their field and complete their education. As a matter of happenstance, the two were drafted for the same expedition to Svalbard. It took them two hours to make the trip to the southern coast as there was a lack of concise roads, and the way there was treacherous. They started their journey in the early morning, so they would return in time by the end of the day. As they got to their location via snowmobile, the pair unpacked their things and set up a small camp for the time being, as they needed to eat and prepare their equipment. It took them not but 20 minutes to set everything up and half the time to eat, so they were free to explore and analyze what they needed. Jana always told Franz that sediment was the most uninteresting thing they could study, and it was true. They were terribly bored the entire time, and Franz reported feeling awkward occasionally, as if they were being watched. He just brushed it off as the weeks of their trip were getting to him. They continued working for the better part of three hours before they decided it was enough and that they could start the trip back to the research base. It took them longer to pack their things than unpack them, as they were tired from work. After 30 minutes of packing, the pair was finally ready to return. Nothing was out of the ordinary for the first 20 minutes of the trip until they reached a jutting of rocks that they had to get around. The snow started falling, and it looked like a storm was mounting, so they accelerated. In their haste, they failed to notice the lumbering shape lurking behind the rocks and the speed it was running at the moment. Franz felt a tremendous force knock into his right side which toppled him, Yana, and the snowmobile. He could not see anything from the snow in his eyes, but when he cleared his vision, he could only see the snowmobile upright and still running. However, Yana was nowhere to be found. He yelled out her name, but there was no response. The storm was still picking up, and he knew they both ran the risk of getting hypothermia, Yana even more so if she was knocked out by whatever slammed into them. He unhooked the rifle from their snowmobile and walked around the area, carefully keeping the vehicle in his sights so he would not lose it. Staying on foot during a storm like that was akin to signing your death warrant. After a few minutes, Franz could hear cries muffled by the furious wind around him and pushed forward only to see something he would never forget. Jana was lying on her stomach, facing him with a massive polar bear pressing down. It sank its teeth into Yana's shoulder and pulled, each movement squeezing another scream from its victim. Yana saw Franz and screamed for help, and Franz reacted immediately. He was not accustomed to shooting a rifle, but had to act. He took his stance, shouldered the butt of the weapon, took aim, and pulled the trigger. The gun was jammed. All of the defiant hope in Franz's heart at that moment was washed away, by the hopeless click of the useless firearm. His hands tremored, and he lowered the gun. Yana kept screaming, but Franz knew he could do nothing against a full-grown polar bear, so he slowly backed away into the snowfall, back toward the snowmobile. As he made his way there, Yana's screams slowly got quieter, and they were cut off suddenly. At that moment, Franz knew his colleague's life was snuffed out. In somber silence, he mounted the vehicle and began his journey back to the research station.
It took him twice as long to get there due to the storm and poor visibility, but he had just enough gas left. When he got there, he met with the rest of the group in the main building. They were playing cards. When one of them noticed Franz, they made a sarcastic remark about Yana being late as usual, but their friendly tone shifted when they saw the ghastly expression on Franz's face. After much questioning about where Yana was, Franz broke down in the sobs and fell to the floor. He explained what had happened and the group was in utter shock. They knew that the storm was too strong to go out then, so they resolved to leave the base in the morning to look for Yana. The following morning, the four of them set out on two snowmobiles to look for their colleague. After the standard two hours, they arrived at the site of the attack, but Yana was nowhere to be found. As they looked around more, they could see something dark contrasting the whiteness of the snow in the distance. Investigating closer, they could see what it was. Clothes. Ragged scraps of clothes were piled on one spot, surrounded by a wide splatter of blood. Franz moved forward to examine it, and as he pulled the fabric up, he fell back, reeling onto the ground. He screamed as he threw up, and all he could manage to do was point in the general direction of the clothes. The rest of the group has a similar reaction. Under the clothes was the frozen hollow husk of Yana's body picked apart and left by the bear. They used a tarp they brought along to wrap the remains in and took them back to the base out of respect for their colleague. The authorities were called and all of the regular measures were taken to make sure that Yana's remains would be sent back to Ukraine to her family. The rest of the group was told that they would still have to finish their assignment despite the circumstances, which infuriated them. They called the office to collectively resign from their positions and organized a flight with the funds they had left over. Although the group knew how dangerous polar bears were, they did not blame Franz for not saving Yana. Franz could never forgive himself for what happened. He resigned from geology and took up a simple accounting job in his hometown. Story 2 Ivan was an engineering student from Moscow who formed a solid friendship with a few of his colleagues, even getting to the point where they created a tradition of camping in remote regions of their country every year. They met during their freshman year in 1999 and stayed close throughout their bachelor's and master's programs. In total, there were four of them, Ivan, Marta, Alex, and Myla. Not all of them studied the same subjects, but shared interests brought them together. In 2002, when all of them had finally finished their bachelor's programs, they decided a more fitting journey was in order, so they planned to go to Greenland. It was much further away, hundreds of miles away from their country, but they were excited nonetheless. It took some prying with their parents for permission to go, so organizing the trip extended into multiple weeks. Eventually, they managed to convince Myla's parents to let her go. During their final visit to her home, they were all waiting in front of her apartment when she came out carrying her backpack. Her mother followed closely behind, sternly warning everyone to care for her only daughter, before melting into a kind smile, one of pride for how they all grew up. They were finally on their way, and the six-hour flight passed quickly through friendly banter and pleasant conversation. They arrived in Nuuk late at night and immediately went to their accommodation to rest. They decided to get lunch together the next morning before seeing the sights. They walked around the town, taking everything in, even meeting some of the locals who were very friendly and inviting. After sampling some local cuisine and spirits, one asked a local about good camping locations. They immediately mentioned the small settlement of Kangek, where they could spend a few days and return to the capital. The idea seemed like a good one, and their decision was set when the local told them that a man near the coast would take them there for cheap. They talked to the man, and he said that the boat would only be able to take them there the following day, as he had business to tend to at the capital. The group got his number and returned to the town to enjoy more sights. They had drinks later in the night and retired for the evening. The following day, like clockwork, the captain was on his boat waiting for them to show up. They packed provisions for multiple days, and within a few hours, they were at the settlement. 
They were in awe of Greenland's beauty without the city's busyness. Ivan thanked the captain and shook hands with him. He told the young man that he would be back in two days from then, and they should be ready for that. The rest of their day went along smoothly. They pitched their tents first so they wouldn't have to do it later, and afterward they took a walk along the shoreline, admiring the views. Ivan and Alex went together one way, while Myla and Marta went the other. Eventually, they made a full circle around the settlement and decided to make a fire using some of the firewood other visitors left. The houses here were derelict and worn down, but not unsightly. The girls prepared some meat and potatoes for everyone, and they greeted the night laughing, joking, and reminiscing about their fondest memories. When the night dimmed, they all felt tired and decided to sleep. Ivan and Mila shared a tent, while Marta and Alex had their own. At night, Ivan was awakened by a strange shuffling noise around his tent. The shadow overlapping the moonlight was massive, and as he attempted to open his tent flap, he felt an immense weight come pressing down on him from outside. He could barely move, and as he struggled to breathe, the side of the tent was slashed open to reveal the massive head of a polar bear illuminated by the moonlight. He screamed in surprise and immediately pulled his arms up to protect himself, but it was useless. By then, the bear had already started its attack, and few things would drive it away from its prey. Ivan felt the bear's sharp claws dig deep into his sides, and the bear's razor-sharp teeth bite into his arms. He screamed in agony as the others rushed out of their tents. Alex was in front, and when he saw what was happening, he told the girls to stay back. With Ivan screaming in the background, he picked up a large rock near one of their tents and heaved it above his head. He later noted that it made no sense for him to even be able to pick the rock up given its weight, but he chalked that up to adrenaline. As he looked down on his friend getting mauled, he tossed the rock, hitting the bear squarely on the head. It let go of his arms immediately and stumbled back, grunting wearily. It assumed a threatening stance once more and seemed to want to charge in again, but by that point, Alex and the girls stood in front of Ivan and screamed as loudly as they could. It was a standoff, and the bear slowly turned around and ran in the opposite direction. They stood there in abject terror, as they had no idea what to do should the bear decide to return. So they just watched it, and as soon as it was far enough away, they turned toward Ivan, who was whimpering in pain. They started a new fire and bundled him up in blankets after tending to his wounds. He is alive today, but if the attack had continued for a moment more, his wounds would have been too severe for them to mend. They stayed by his side until the morning, with Alex sitting on the shore in the early morning hours and calling for the fishermen to hurry. When he filled him in on the situation, they carried Ivan back to the boat and immediately started the journey back to Nuuk. He was pale and his speech was fuzzy, but he was still breathing properly, so they were hopeful. They got to Nuuk fairly quickly, and the fishermen immediately phoned emergency services to come and get Ivan. When he was admitted to the nearby clinic, his friends waited with bated breath, hoping that Ivan's body had no lasting damage. After what seemed like hours, the doctors finally came out and informed them that Ivan would pull through, and there would be minimal lasting damage to his tendons. They were relieved and started planning a trip back as they knew Ivan would like to be with his family. The flight back to Moscow was uneventful, but the earful they all received from Ivan's parents after they heard about what had happened would be something they would never forget. They felt horrible that they could not do more for their friend, but ultimately he said he was grateful for them being there that day and he would not be alive if it weren't for Alex's quick thinking. Story 3 our third and final story took place on a remote Arctic research base, where Amir Marsh spent a few months examining the local wildlife and conducting research in his field. Since the station was fairly small, there was no need to have multiple people there, as the job was simple enough for one person to do. When he gave his statement, he said he did not remember where the base was and did not care to think about it too much due to the trauma. 
At the time of the incident, he was on the job for about two weeks out of the needed four, and the situation was as ordinary as it could be. The research post was similar to a small cabin, with stairs leading to the vast expanse of snow and a small cellar to keep his food frozen. Life was, by all accounts, miserable, but Amir enjoyed it all the same. He liked to write in his spare time, so the peace and quiet were great for inspiration. However, what happened during his third week at the post would forever tear down the safety of peace and quiet. On the third day of his third week at the post, Amir woke up as he usually did, around 5 a.m. Nothing was out of the ordinary, and he started a new chapter in his journal before having coffee and breakfast. He was supposed to go out and analyze some of the local ice for undisclosed reasons, so he packed some supplies in a bag and went for the door. As he tried to open it, it would not budge. He thought it strange that the door would freeze shut over a single night, especially given the heat emanating from his small fireplace, so he decided to shoulder it open. One strong shove later, the door still wouldn't move, so he applied more force. Being stuck in a frozen cabin would have been a terrible fate, so he had to get the door open. After a few moments of shoving, it finally gave way, but with far too much noise than the door would usually make. As it opened, he felt the weight behind it shift gradually, followed by a slamming of something on the railing leading to the outside. He practically fell through the doorway and was met with a flash of white fur. It was a full-grown polar bear. The angle of the door opening made the bear move to the left side of it, where it was blocked into the corner of the railing by the door, and a very surprised Amir. He screamed in surprise as he had never seen a bear of such proportions in the wild before. As the scream left his lungs, the bear responded in kind, growling quite loudly as it started walking toward him. He tried to back into the cabin as he came out, but the bear was simply faster than him and was an inch away in an instant. It slammed into a mirror, tossing him over the railing. He could feel some bones crack as he fell to the ground but that was no time to wallow in pain. The bear was moving down the railing quite quickly, and the only means by which Amir could survive was to dash to the small cellar where he kept his food. Just as he was nearing the cellar, he could hear the bear's heavy footsteps getting closer and closer. He pulled the door open and felt a crushing weight on his back, pushing him forward through the cracked open door. He came tumbling to the ground before suddenly stopping, followed by a sharp pain in his foot. He looked down. His foot was jammed in the door. The bear pressed all its weight against the door, trying to get inside. It could not, but the pressure of the door crushed Amir's shin, splitting the bones in two. He screamed in pain, but the pressure only intensified. It got to the point where he passed out from the pain, waking up who knows how many hours later. When he came to, the pain in his foot was present, but numb from the cold. He tried to move, but everything was aching. Somehow, he managed to prop himself up on his elbows and saw that his foot was still in the doorway, but the bear was gone. He slowly stood up, balancing on his free leg, intending to open the door slightly to free his foot. As he stood up, he lost balance and fell backward hearing a haunting, visceral noise of tendon snapping and skin ripping. When he sat back up to examine the situation, he felt the most intense pain of his life as he realized his foot was no longer attached to his leg. The pain was unbearable, but he knew he had to act quickly. He pulled his belt out and bit down on it, hoping to decrease the pain to a slight degree, but it barely did anything. He hopped on his free leg out of the cellar and up the railing, back to the comforting warmth of his station. He threw a single log on the fire, tied some cloth around his frozen stump of a leg, and eased himself into bed. There was a satellite phone he would use only in the direst of emergencies, so he inputted the number and explained his situation. A team was dispatched to Amir's aid, and they arrived after a few hours finding him in his bed. Luckily, his injuries did not threaten his life at that point, but the resulting infection would spread rapidly if he was not taken care of. 
so they rushed him to another outpost with more people and a doctor. His leg had to be amputated to half his shin, but the damage did not stop there. Amir suffered from cracked ribs and intense trauma that required years of therapy to reach a manageable point. He continued to work for the same research company that hired him in the first place, but he was mostly relegated to logistics instead of actual research. <laughs>